<laughs> Squat down. Hello, can you see us? Hello. Hello. Hey, welcome. Uh, you are watching a special edition of Beyond Screens, uh, indicates Twitch show dedicated to unconventional hybrid, off screen, screen plus, uh, alternative controllers, live games, etc. We're here with Kitchen Cauldron, uh, which was uh, has been a nominee in Indicate this year, and you guys won an award too, right? Uh, we were nominated for an award. Uh, they were nominated. Well, hi, everyone. <laughs> hi. Hi. So this is going to be a crazy Indicate experiment where we're going to actually do a live gameplay session with the creators in this truck. This is literally like a food truck. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the game came about and uh, how they implemented it and all that. So before we begin, we're going to run a short trailer just so you can get a sense of what the overall experience is like. And then we'll be visiting each station live in real time with uh, the creators. So let's cut to trailer. I have no idea when the trailer is going to end, but <laughs> I didn't time it <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I'm like the worst Twitch host. Okay, um, uh, maybe we can. Adam can tell us in in uh, Adam. Uh, so I'm Celia Pierce. I'm the co-founder of Indiecade, and this is a crazy Indiecade Anywhere and Everywhere online week where we're doing tons of weird uh, experiments. And today I'm super excited to be with the creators of Kitchen Cauldron, uh, which is a, a truck full of alt control games that together make a cohesive co-op experience. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start by just having the team go through and show us each station a little bit and talk a little bit about the gameplay for each one. And then we'll have a conversation about how they pull this crazy thing off. Sure. Wonderful. Uh, Thanks, Celia, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Justin. Um, I acted as an instructor, executive producer, kind of role and mentor for this project. Um, and I want to introduce uh, members of my team as well. We have... I'm, uh, I'm Simon. I'm uh, programming and uh, game design. Hi, I'm Wilson. I'm a concept designer. I'm Sammy. I'm game design and production. Awesome. So what we want to do is let's go into the different stations. And uh, Celia, feel free to uh, point us wherever you think that the viewers would want to see. But we're here to give a behind the scenes kind of look into uh, Kitchen Cauldron, um, show some gameplay, and ultimately some of the alternative controllers that went into it, and the overall process of building a multiplayer co-op experience into an actual food truck-like experience. Okay, uh, I can start with just talking in general, uh, give a little bit of context to everyone. So Kitchen Cauldron, it's a, um, it is a food truck. It is a, is a um, questionable food truck business run by uh, Wendy the Witch, who has very questionable business practices. And so in order to recover her, um, her business, she sweeps up like three random bystanders, and this is, in this case, it's us today, uh, to try and be her um, sort of a unwilling labor, <laughs> so to speak. No, but uh, there's three stations. Uh, Simon, if you can go ahead and uh, maybe talk about one of, or actually, Sammy, you can talk about the server station first, because that's where it starts off from. Uh, in terms of the game. So what does the server do? Yeah, so, so the server is kind of like the heart of the trailer where like you can't really give out food, you can't really give out drinks to people without having the server take orders yourself as well as like get them out to customers. So the, the server game, we have this crystal ball. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, but this essentially acts as a mouse input as Sorry, technical difficulties. Can, can we bring the camera down to the crystal ball so we can see that interface? It's so cool. Yeah, so we have this crystal ball input that essentially uses. Too many mics. That essentially acts out. Testing, testing. Here, I'll take over this. 
stand by, folks. Like I said, this is a crazy experiment. Okay. Oh. Um, so with this crystal ball over here, uh, just if you can point the tires downward, then mouse track ball that we fixed a magical crystal where the player kind of like just like moves their ball around and massages the thoughts or in this case food orders or drink orders out of custom rice while at the same time keeping track making sure that they're patient that they're happy that they're getting their food orders on time um making sure that they essentially relay as like kind of like a leader to the barista and the chef stations individually that like, hey, I need like um, an avocado toast or hey, I need a black cat boba. Give it to me like snappy, snap, 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 super fast pace. Um, so they're kind of like the manager of the station. They take your food orders from the customers. They whip out orders and dole them out to the barista and ship. And they also like take the orders and submit them with this handy little dandy like ring bell that like submits orders to people. Or you could be like, hey, I don't like these orders. Um, I'm going to trash them. And if your workers aren't really get doing things right in the chaos at the moment, so you'd be like, Burm, and it sends it down to the trash. Well, awesome. Uh, uh, just a question here. So two questions here. One is, that is the, that is the position that's taking the orders. Mm -hmm. And yep. is it also the position that's giving the food to the customers? Yes, you would be interacting uh, with the customers as the server. And you're saying that if, if the server doesn't like the quality of the food that the other players have produced, they can throw it out and have it done over? Yeah, no, it's um, more so like we have a limitation for how much food and drinks that the server station can actually hold. So uh -huh. let's say that you're in the amount of the chaos and like you're yelling orders left and right. Uh, sometimes people make the wrong order, but we have limited slots. So if that gets filled up and time is running out or you need to get to other customers fast, the server will then make that decision to essentially trash unwanted food orders. Like I said, like in real life, it'll be like food orders that are cold that are make, made by mistake or by accident mm. to make space for the correct ones and make sure that the business can keep running on a streamlined process. And all the orders are actually being yelled. In other words, you're not sending the orders via a computer. You're actually yelling them to the other players. Yeah, that was like one of the parts that we kind of wanted to do on purpose because this is not just a virtual game, but it's a mix. It's a themed entertainment space. So we wanted yeah. to mix, have a mixture of both physical and verbal elements that we perform Great. in the wor real world, as well as the digital elements, such as the actual gameplay themselves. And actually, that's a good transition into the next station Great. with uh, Simon, who is our um, who is in charge of our chef station today. And then we'll also mm -hmm. be able to talk a little bit about um, mention the um, the physical interaction that you have to have with players verbally. We wanted to really capture that essence of what does it feel like to be in a food truck service business. Um, but at the same time, too, Simon will go about how those orders are communicated digitally. Yeah. So, um, so the server needs to shout at the uh, the chef or the person who's making drinks. Um, they, so sh the server needs to tell them what to make. But um, you know, if we make the thing on the on the chef game or on the server game or on the uh, drink making game, we actually do have to send that digitally back to the server. Um, so you can't really cheat. You can't say like, "Oh, I made it," right? And then the server puts it in because um, if you didn't make it, you didn't make it, right? Um, so that part is digital. But the um, the first half of that is totally verbal. You need to you need to have good communication skills, um, and that's about it. Yeah, as far as it, yeah, right. should I explain the show? Yeah, absolutely. So let's say we got an order from the uh, from the server station for um, a mermaid fish taco. So Sammy would say that verbally over to Simon and Simon in this station. <laughs> and then I would and then I would make the fish taco. Um, but our screen is uh, yeah, right. we're not playing. But so, the, so basically, you're you, she's yelling it to you. You're making it, and then you're digitally sending it back to her. So it's almost like a, a yeah, I get it. I was going to say it's almost like a game, but obviously it is a game. Okay, go on. But um, with with the with the server, uh, I mean, sorry, with the 
with the chef station that uh, Simon's at, for example, you'll see that it, there's actually a mix of different inputs. What's actually re really important is with each sort of role we have in this truck is that they're all different sorts of engagement models. So for example, with these- Can, you zoom, can you zoom in a little bit to the controllers there at the order station, just so we can, or at the, not the, 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 the chef, chef station. station. Saying, right? Yeah, sure, so the sure. chef, so you've got this book. What is this book? <laughs> you want to explain the book a little bit? Yeah. So this is our um, this is our recipe spell book. Um, so what you do is you press one of the buttons in order to uh, toggle to the correct recipe. So we have it um, just text right here, and we have the corresponding buttons, right? So if you need to make avocado toast, then you would go to the avocado page, um, and you would be able to make your avocado toast, and it would populate the game with the necessary ingredients, right? And so then you would need to pick your tools, and you would need to process these ingredients before making the order and sending it back to the server. Um, the way you process ingredients is uh, the elite motion. So we have this camera down here that um, basically is just tracking your hands at all times. Um, so you can see your virtual hands in real, in, in, in the game world, uh, almost oh, like okay. VR. Um, wow. So it's kind of a hybrid. It's in between VR and uh, analog. And analog, <laughs> sure. Um, you spawn in your different tools by pressing on one of three uh, buttons that have a tool sigil on them. So we can see this one right here has a knife on it. If you want your knife to come in, you would press the knife button and it would spawn oh. in your knife and it would despawn the other tools. And this is just to prevent unnecessary clutter on the screens. And so uh, what you would see is as you're moving your hands around, if you hit the knife, you'll see the knife in one of the hands that you see on the screen. It won't pop up in your hand, but it'll um, magically kind of poof in right here. As oh, such. I see. And then you have to pick it up. And then I would have to pick it up with my oh. hand. And then I can process the ingredients. The pan isn't used for any of these. So I'll use the knife and I will cut up some of this cursed avocado here. <laughs> cursed, cursed avocado? Yeah. So now I can throw it in the microwave like any good uh, chef. Oh, that is so cool. And I'm one, I'm one third of the way down making my avocado toast. Owl cotto? So is that what you are you saying? Owl cotto? I am saying owl cotto, yeah. As in a bird? As in a bird. This this bird in particular. <laughs> um, oh. oh wow. Yeah. So we gotta we gotta process our oh, owl. Oh god. Oh, oh poor no. owl. One of the great so things about it. Let's spawn another owl really quick. Let's spawn another owl. One of the great things it's about it is the concept artists have to actually start in 2D. And then for this game in particular, it was feeling very Paper Mario-esque. So the logical conclusion was to create a 3D model of it. Uh, having known that our final output was going to be a trailer, um, we had the 3D models in hand. So we wanted to set dress it with the actual 3D printed models of all the props that you would see I in game. I love this so much. So you can see the process, you can see the owl in its full form. You can also see it after it's processed here. And all of the different drinks, food, other items that you would see in game adorn the set decorations That's as well. That's just brilliant. I love that. Why don't more people do that? So easy, it's such a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a happy kind of happen sense. We knew that we were going to have to set decorate anyway, but the, the, going through the process logically, having with the 2D art that's created for here with the menu, and then having to know that, you know, by, by just pure game necessity that we needed to have it in 3D, lent its opportunity to have the 3D models ready in, uh, for when we needed to actually decorate it physically. Great. We, so we treated the whole project as sort of like a, we, we're like a small indie team and we're doing the entire production pipeline. So we did, all of the art assets like um uh in a way that's like sort of easy to you know um replicate in different forms for example like obviously mm -hmm. uh doing the 2d art for the uh food ingredients but also doing the 3d so they function in game and then mm -hmm. also make them in physicality uh so there's a lot of assets where we did it uh 2d like flat digitally and then did it in 3d digitally and then transformed it into reality yeah and actually here we can see the, the communication mechanic that happens verbally in real time. So Sam so now, over here is going to go ahead and we have a customer waiting. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, like, we didn't pay attention. We're kind of like slacking a little. So we're going to miss this little old lady. We're also about to miss this older man. Mm -hmm. So, But you can kind of see with this server game, we're kind of doing like massaging out the slots, looking for the right spot, like just the right spot. Like where are there? 
o'clock, so they all come to sleep. So we ring the bell, raging game. Sorry, we got some money, and we serve the customer. They're happy, and with that, we're gonna like just keep doing that loop. Oh, that's great! So you take the order, you yell it over there. The yeah, chef the makes it, like, sends it back. Yeah. Where's the handmade crepe? Why you slap it? <laughs> so here uh the handmade crepe came in so wilson went ahead and pressed the um, handmade crepe button let's get some gameplay oh, audio as well so we can hear the great out. sound effects and audio design that you all had it bugged out <laughs> oh here we go we're back so now we have the layer of music onto it after explaining some of the controllers so um handmade crepe was um was go ahead and was selected. So Wilson was able to press the button and then try his attempt at making the handmade crepe. After each session, the screen doors come down on each station and then we go from land to land exploring different areas and different kinds of customers that we have to explore. A cutscene happens on the main screen up front here where our lovely host, Wendy the Witch, is able to talk to us about the next kind of um, destination that we have on the lineup for today's route. <laughs> so from there, we'd be able to go back. Uh, we have a new destination where Sam was able to see different kinds of characters as well. We have like a new cast of characters that we interact with. They each share their own little lines. Um, which is all voice acted by everyone on the Kiki Talking crew. Like, Ooh. I need a toast box. And this time, so we have a drink order up. So, what we're going to go ahead and do is highlight the drink station now with a barista. You want to talk about it, Wilson? Oh, yeah, barista time. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the toast box is slushy, so you want to walk us through that, Wilson? So, um, this is the barista station, obviously from Sammy. She uh, gave us the order that a customer wants the Toe Frog slushy. So you can see here, uh, there's a bunch of different physical, the whole purpose of the barista station is that they're juggling a whole bunch of analog buttons. So for example, uh, similar to the chef game, there is a recipe change. Uh, so you'll see on the right side here, amongst all this butter, <laughs> for example, black pie boba, toe frog slushy. This is the one one we want, and what we'd be using is this blender right here. But before we can use the blender, we gotta we gotta add liquids to it. So there's these three buttons here where you're trying to manage the liquid levels, and while that's going, while that's all within level, you're trying to blend. Starting off by one over. Can you turn the blender on. Oh my god. Done. <laughs> And then I would click submit. It's not done. Wait, did you turn the blender on? So this is a chaotic kind of game right here where oh. the different liquid levels are dropping uh, different potions. And then there we go. And then I click submit. And then and then Sammy will get it on her side. And oh, well, unfortunately, the customer kind of left because they're a little bit slow. <laughs> Each customer actually has a patience level as well. So you can actually see it dropping over time. And when they're uh, not fulfilled, they will go ahead and leave. And you actually. Um, okay, we have a successful one. We have the Cauldron Kombucha. We have it in line. We're going to ring the doorbell, get some money. As you can see, the wow. door meter goes up. What, what drink do we Oh, we need, we need food. We need, we need food. food, actually. We need the <laughs> chef here. But the chef, where are you? But we, can, we can do an actual whole playthrough. Yeah, uh, after so. like, we introduce all these stations. Yeah. yeah. So that was one example of a cauldron kombucha. What are the different kinds of uh, alternative controllers happening in this station? So we saw the blender. There's a blender here. There's also the cocktail mixer right here. So uh, mm -hmm. anyone can take a guess as to what's in here. The original ideation, for example, was actually we tried to repurpose a Wii remote. So we tried to connect the Wii remote to the computer and we tried to do a little bit of, you know, the techno wizardry to get it to function. And it kind of did, but then um, the signal wouldn't go through. So we had to iterate and sort of- It wouldn't of, go like, through um, the metal. Mechanical. You couldn't get the Wii signal to go through the metal. Yes, exactly. But, um, like this is like one problem for like this station, like all the other stations, like all went through this sort of process where we made like initial iterations of like controllers. And then after through some abuse and some testing, like we had to uh, change it up. But I think right now there's like a rubber ball in here that's like 
hitting another analog button in there. So I <laughs> love that. When when you guys said that in the talk, I was like, wait, you just there's just a button in there. That's it. But it feels yes. what I love is that it feels really good. It feels really authentic. And because you put something in there and you can feel a sort of an object moving around inside of the thing, it seems like it would feel like you really were making a cocktail. Is that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And we didn't get that kind of analog feedback had we uh, used the B-mode. It didn't have that kind of um, the actual feeling of like an ice cube getting sloshed around in the metal cup. Yeah, yeah. It's so good. Right, wonderful. So let's go ahead and see, um, talk about the, the last station that we have here. We, so we have the, the blender, we have the shaker. What's the thing in the middle right here? This right here, um, this is Cauldron. a stirrer. So, <laughs> so this, uh, this game is called Kitchen Cauldron. And of course we needed a cauldron in here, but there, there is uh, some of the recipes will actually have you uh, stir certain ingredients. So I forget which one it was, for example. Cauldron kombucha. Oh, the signature course. drink. Yeah. <laughs> But yes. So, um, is that a joystick? What is that in there? It is a joystick in here. So, um, one of the constraints is we use different kinds of. For the most part, everything in here is either a keyboard keyboard input that has been repurposed to be an actual different button press and has been mapped accordingly. Uh, it is a joystick in here, and then it's pretty much labeled as any joystick would be um, up, down, left, right arrow, WASD, and then those four inputs combined together. Each one pressed a certain amount of time equals 25% of the drink. So if we go um, ahead and hit the, the change recipe and we go make a cauldron kombucha, and then we adjust the levels here to make sure that it's in line. The oh, right ingredient amounts, one. yeah. <laughs> right oh, ingredient oh, right oh, nice. So button press. And then this is where we click submit. And you've and got the, here the, the light menu. The light's coming down to look like it's going into the cauldron. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> That's so cool. And then from here, we're able to submit orders to right on time. And then we get cash. And there that. you go. There you go. That's fantastic. So that's a little bit behind the scenes in terms of all of them. Everything for the most part are uh, button key put, uh, keyboard inputs. Um, with the exception of the crystal ball, which is a refurbished trackball, which is ultimately just mouse input. Um, and lastly, and the joystick. Least, and joystick. And then the last one that we have here is the leap motion being um, another non traditional peripheral that we have. Right, for the right. Ball. That's so but great. Everything is mapped to keyboard keys, um, anything on the keyboard, on the secret keyboard, um, even the hollowed out buttons that right here that switch between. Uh, the different kinds of tools from the knife to the pan to the deep fryer are actually just a keyboard or button presses as well, all mm -hmm. wired up. Um, is that like a piece of a log? Your... What is that? It's yeah, actually, uh, all of the props to, to go uh, to talk about set design, for instance, all of the props uh, came from uh, found materials here in Los Angeles. So um, if not, Offer up Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, dumpster um, diving. Dumpster diving. Uh, there was a lot of different kinds of. We are very fortunate in Los Angeles to be surrounded by uh, the entertainment industry, where we just have so many leftover materials from sets, from TV shows, from commercials, that. Um, that we are able to utilize um, in our own kind of uh, set decorations. So um, the logs, for instance, were found. Someone you know recently had firewood that they had on you know um, like a Craigslist ad, and we were able to get that um, to kind what of have it circle. What is that radio looking thing that you just scan quickly by? What's oh, that? This is, <laughs> uh, all set decoration. So they don't have any actual function in game, but they there's just, a lot of hidden Easter eggs that we planted throughout. For instance, if you were actually to play this radio, it does in fact work. It just plays music. It just Any plays kind of music, music, right? But uh, there's a lot of hidden Easter eggs throughout the in, entire experience here that the designers just had fun creating. Um, as Sammy had mentioned in the um, the the chat for Indiecade Festival, that uh, it was an opportunity for the designers to not just make in-game kind of Easter eggs, but physical ones as well. Uh, things such as the cutting board, having everyone's original names in there, the cast and crew. Oh, nice. Um, just little things that you would find all around. That's 
So um, as great. well as if you look at the little details such as yeah. uh, we have parody books across the board, um, classic cooking books that uh, the students had went in and uh, changed their names to match a witch theme kind of um, environment. It's just great. Um, this is a good segue to this sort of um, process conversation. So I love this so much, you guys. It's so cool. Um, you, when we were getting ready to go live, you said a great thing, Justin, that cracked me up. And I think it's a great place to start the conversation about how this was made, which is you said, it's kind of backyard imagineering. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what backyard imagineering looks like from a game development perspective? No, absolutely. Um, it's, it's not really a, a coin that we've termed ourselves, but a lot of people kind of um, made the reference to um, the kind of program that we developed here being a little Imagineering studio or an aspirational one at least. Uh, so it, it's very rare that in our industry that we'll have like a concept designer or a game designer um, step out of their field or their lane to actually make the props physically, to set decorate themselves, to to come in voice act in addition to all of the, the, the things that they are, um, that, that's required of their specific task or role. So um, when people uh, lightly refer to us as backyard engineers, it's, that's kind of our colloquial take on saying, you know, we're not a full out, we don't have the budget or the manpower or the necessarily expertise that a traditional creative studio or uh, R&D arm that would have uh, like Imagineering or Universal Creative would have, uh, but we are able to kind of make do with what little resources we have. And um, in my experience, dealing with a lot of creatives, that a lot of amazing things happen when you're given creative constraints. Um, very often you give a creative a blank piece of paper and honestly, it's, even myself, it's like a deer in headlights, you don't know what exactly to make. But then um, when we were given the task of creating something like, hey, your, your constraint is multiplayer co-op. We have this a uh, decrepit looking trailer, what can you do given these kinds of variables? What can you imagine within it? So here's a question for you for a starting point, because you said this in your talk the other day that it started out with the trailer. Who, who came to you and said, I have a trailer and I want you to make a co-op game in it? Like who's the client in that scenario? <laughs> the, the funny thing is it, it was another thing that happened just by happenstance and necessity. Um, my my uh, my co-partner in this Fernando and I we were we were talking about um, like what what this experience could be and uh, we were very fortunate to be housed in the art center campus um, but at the same time too uh, there are very limited resources when fighting for classroom space for instance um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was create an immersive world but not we didn't necessarily have a dedicated room per se we were we were bounced between rooms that were you know. Uh, upstairs or in basements, and it wasn't really conducive oh, to, to I logging, feel you. <laughs> well, logging and things what's, around. What's hard so, about the, this kind of a thing too, and I've, I've run into this myself at my own institution, is that not only do you need some space, but you need some space where you can leave shit. Yes. And so you leave this, you got to leave the stuff there and people come in all hours of the day and night. Uh, a lot of times the buildings are closed you know, and you can't get in at night. And it's just, so having this sort of self-contained trailer unit gives you kind of a space. It's a very small cramped space. But one of the things that's so delightful about this game is that you turn the cramped space into a feature. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, it was, it was burst out of necessity. Um, we, we, since we were kind of denied a, de a designated space per se, or, you know, even when we pitched this idea of what it could be, it, it's hard to really understand it without having lived or seen it firsthand. So uh, we said, you know what, we keep the classroom space. We do need one in particular, but we'll build our experience out in the parking lot. It was during the so pandemic, where, not many people were coming in. Where did the trailer um, so come from? We decided from? to did park you, a trailer here. But where did you get the trailer? Absolutely. Did, so, uh, <laughs> uh, came from um, another kind of binge watching or uh, binging throughout the, um, the, the, the Craigslist Facebook marketplace universe. Uh, look, we knew that we wanted the trailer. We didn't think that it was going to take this particular form factor. Uh, we were looking for more of an open bed kind of initial concept where the students would create a framework using, uh, you know, a carpentry and woodworking kind of school uh, tool sets that they have um, and skill sets that they are needed for the class. Um, and from there, we were going to build it out. But as time went on, uh, we came upon this trailer that was just like in the countryside, a little bit like farmland. It was been on this farmer's land for about 10 plus years. And it was this time to, you know, 
use the pandemic as a time to uh, reflect on what's needed. And then they had this trailer for sale and we jumped on that opportunity. Oh, so the trailer wasn't given to you. You found it as part of your design process. Exactly. Oh, okay. And oh, which came about uh, the process of understanding that the parking lots during the pandemic were were empty. Uh, everyone was taking remote classes and then that let us, you know, there's space there. Oh, that's so great. I love that um, opportunism of like, oh, well, this is a problem right now, but it gives us an opportunity, right? Absolutely. So resourceful. Um, and then, yeah, so you were talking a little bit about dumpster diving and Craigslist. That sounds like so much fun. Did you have a, do you have like a, um, uh, like a, a soldering, like makerspace, Arduino lab type of place that you could build all these gadgets in? Yeah, absolutely. I kind of want to toss that on to uh, one of the, 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 the awesome talent that we had here. Talk a little bit more about um, Wilson. Talk a little bit more about the process. Hi, what kind of skill sets beyond concept art and game design that we had to learn physically from the electronic side to the fabrication side? What did we have to do as a prerequisite to kind of get to this level? Okay, uh, so um, obviously you guys know that we come from Art Center as sort of our education yeah. background. And Art Center is a design school. And they, I think like the biggest draw for Art Center for quite a few decades was like its industrial design department. Uh, mm. So, at least for, for all of us here, we come from Art Center's entertainment design department, which currently has like three different tracks. There's like a game design track, there's a concept design track, and there is um, um, animation animation track. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, but for concept, at least uh, for me as a concept designer, I, so I can speak on that a little bit more. Um, that uh, that sort of um, role used to come from being in like Hollywood, for example, when mm -hmm. when you have designers who would actually do concepts for things and also have to make like the props for it. Uh, so our background was like very rooted in that, very rooted in uh, like the actual practical um, design skills that uh, transportation designers and product designers have to exercise. So um, it was really funny you mentioned earlier, like the sort of resourcefulness that comes out of like the backyard Imagineering aspect. We also had on the other side, like the super disciplined, like best practices, like aware uh, sort of the education that we were able to balance uh, between. We ended up getting an actual classroom, thankfully, uh, where we were able to sort of like set it up as like our own space to, um, for us to kind of like uh, eat, sleep, live, breathe, work, like 24 seven sort of thing. But uh, Justin, um, Thank, thankfully, like he's super resourceful and he has a lot of resources. Uh, he brought in a lot of stuff that allowed us to um, do a lot of like soldering, for example, mm -hmm. for the game track. Uh, one of one of their key like programs currently is like engaging with alternative controllers, as an example. Mm -hmm. That's where yeah. they get really hands on and not just like dive into like oh like level design and stuff like that. Um, but there's there's definitely like uh, tons. We all wore different hats all the time. Um, yeah, pretty That's crazy. Cool. Did you, can I ask you as a concept, a concept designer, did you actually sketch, did you do sketches of the idea? Like, what did you, what was the process of getting the design from inside your head to out here? <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, so um, at least for us, so there were four concept designers uh, and each of us was like uh, slightly different, of course, like ours all being, but um, Let's see, how do I put this? We kind of had to settle on things like democratically. So for example, we all had different ideas from the beginning of like a visual style. Also, mm -hmm. different. this wasn't always like a witch themed truck. Uh, before there was like oh. a sci-fi theme. Uh, there used oh. to be like a zombie apocalypse theme. But in, in that like whole brainstorming session uh, between like the four concept artists, we were also uh, deciding on like an accessible like art style and uh, accessible art aesthetic that is um, relatively easy to produce, right? So that's why it was like two, very like that cartoony 2D at yeah, first. Yeah, sure. Um, the, we had no intention at all of doing any 3D, uh, but then because one of the game designers, like one of their games ended up being working best in a 3D space, we ended up like shifting some design to try and fit that. So there's a lot of problem solving for that too, because when you do a 3D model, right, uh, it doesn't look like, uh, 
the 2D style. So we had to like figure out like, oh, how do we add like black outlines to all the characters? Mm -hmm. Give it like a tune shader sort do of thing. Like yeah, 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 like a cell shading. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. But, yeah, we did all the art. So for example, like the backgrounds right now that you see on the screens, like even this like shutter, it's like a Photoshop, uh, it's a Photoshop painted file. Uh, there's different layers and stuff like that. Um, it also really helped too, because when we worked in, uh, I hate to like, <laughs> shove in like Adobe as, as if, like um, it's product placement for them. But then um, it is a professional working tool. So for example, there's like different like layers. Uh, so for example, file integration with the game itself is really easy whenever we set like scene transitions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, these are all things we, were, we had to like sort of like work together to figure out. Because then for concept designers, we usually just do 2D art. We don't know how stuff is directly integrated into yeah, yeah. a game so for us for all seven of us this was really like uh diving into everything production wise like what really needs uh have to be met to get these things like functional as a product i, I feel like Thanks, that there's a, a really interesting um backstory here which is that you guys made this really intense co-op game by cooperating with each other very intensely so there's some there's something about the process that's reflected, I think, in the experience. That's really interesting. Um, the other thing I wanted to add uh, was that, you know, as you were showing it, I was going, wow, this art. I mean, when you're talking about people having these high level skills that they've developed in this art school, I mean, the art looks spectacular. And for, uh, you know, I know a lot of, we've had a lot of indicates have a lot of these hacking games and all controller games. And I have to say, this is among the best looking art I've seen in an alt controller game at Indicate because of the fact that there's artists, right? That the people who can actually make pretty things, that's what you're trained to do. And so it, it even though it's funky and cool, it's also really beautiful. And, and you can see that level of professional execution across all these different domains that you worked in. Really nice. Uh, super appreciative of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you guys about too, you know. from, a, from a game design perspective that I, that I really like about this game. So my background is actually in going back to the 80s in in-person multiplayer co-op games. Like that's what I specialize in and what I, what I think is really interesting in all in those kind of games and why I've always been so passionate about them is that the most interesting thing about the game is what happens between the players. Did you guys think about like choreographing or scripting or kind of crafting that between people aspect of the experience as you were developing these crazy alternative controllers? I mean, this is a lot of stuff to keep in your head as you're thinking about a design. I'm curious yep. to hear your thoughts about it. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's funny that you bring up like the, the, the kind of golden age of arcade kind of co-op in-person experiences, because that's one of the, the, the factors that actually the students had to do uh, research for before actually even touching the trailer itself. I want to hand it over to one of our game design students who can talk about that kind of research and development aspect. What were some of the, the places that we visited in person? So, yeah, um, and I didn't, by the way, I didn't do it for arcades. I did it for theme parks. <laughs> Um, I, actually work, I actually work for theme parks, except on the high end version of the multiplayer, like with a VR, a flight simulator, for instance. Um, oh, absolutely. absolutely. But, but with, that, with that same craft of attention to like, really, I'm trying to design what's happening between the players. Everything else is supporting that, right? Absolutely. And I'm going to hand Great. it over to Sam. You can talk more about that kind of experience. Great, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Hi there. Um, yeah, especially with the three games, something that we noticed early on during playtesting is that we were missing that synergy component that we kind of get nowadays with all three games being together. Um, because initially we kind of had a lot of like, we we're like kind of like finicking around with the, especially with the server design, but we kind of had the chef and barista were thinking like, oh, these games are like pretty fun to play, but we're missing that component, that component was in itself communication between the players right. so it helped us kind of guide the design for the server game to kind of be the cohesion or the glue between the two in order to make it a holistic experience rather than mm. individual one prototypes so so you're taking the focus of attention because i think it'd be easy to make a game where you have three people just on computers doing this yeah. right 
Um, but instead you have a game where the computers are just pushing them back out to interact with each other in a way. Yeah, it's kind of like acting in like reverse where instead of going into more and more to the digital space, the digital space is encouraging physical and verbal interaction with one another. Okay, acting in reverse, I'm stealing that also. That's brilliant. Uh, that's exactly kind of what I was thinking about. Like, like, this must be fun to watch people play because it's so, it has, it's such high energy. It reminds me, the mechanic reminds me a little bit of Space Team. Have you guys played Space Team? Oh, you, oh, you should play Space Team. And you'll, when, as soon as you play it, you'll be like, oh, I see what she's saying. Uh, Space Team is a game where it's an iPad game or iPhone game and you're all in a spaceship. And you're trying to, you know, ride the spaceship, but the thing is falling apart and you, you're, your instructions go with my controls. So like three to five players and, you know, you'll be like, uh, turn up the piston to five and I'm the one who has the piston, but you don't know who has it. So you're just yelling at whoever has it. So it's that same thing where really the most fun thing is what, and then it becomes a performance. So it's really, really fun to watch as well. That's so great. And then some other designs, um, things that we took into account were actually, I think Wilson or Simon mentioned it a little bit earlier, but with each game, there's a high replayability with this experience because each one caters to, like for example, the server, it kind of caters to people who are more managerial, um, kind of like the leaders of the group. And mm -hmm. then at the chef station where you have to do like, pretty pinpoint focus with accuracy in order to get your recipes done to uh -huh. the best quality. And you have the research station, which is a little bit more like, user-friendly because like a bunch of like analog buttons, you just have like a lot of fun pushing stuff. And because you have three different stations with three different audiences that it appeals to, it becomes an experience that can be played three different ways, as yeah. well as if you're going especially with families, um, Usually bring their little kids or you have old people who don't necessarily have know how to play games. So you can offer yeah, them to their server I love and, that. and then have the people who are a little bit more used to the AR, VR, um, interacting with physical spaces onto the chef station. Yeah, and I mean, I love that you mentioned families because my first thought was, oh, and it's because it's a cooking simulator. It also has really broad appeal across gender and age and everything else. It's that you know, uh, you know, cooking mama audience, but in a like in a backyard imagineering situation. Um, we have to wrap up soon, but I'd love to I'd love to end by just asking you guys what what are you going to do next with this thing? Are you going to try to sell it or commercialize it or take it around and get people to play it around the city or like what's the plan here? I'd love to see this reach a bigger audience. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll. Let's pick the brain of uh, Simon. He was one of our lead uh, programmers for this and, you know, has been with the project even after um, the class had ended and you know, has been doing this on his own time. So we'd love to get his thoughts. Um, yeah, so after this, I think we are going to, for one, uh, clean the interior. <laughs> <laughs> and for two um, I think we're going to end up rebuilding a good chunk of it and we're going to actually I think submit it to GDC so you can imagine how difficult it might be to take this um, any sort of distance uh, things would fall over things would break probably um, so I think we're going to rebuild an actual walled kitchen space that is more portable that we can take down and um, hopefully showcase at GDC. Um, can I, uh, I, I'm gonna make some introductions for you guys. There's a couple of things you should know. One of them is the escape room industry is the fastest growing, was before the pandemic was by far the fastest growing sector of the game industry. For it literally went from zero to like thousands all over the country. So you sort of, and now that the pandemic is waning, it's coming back in force. So um, you should, you guys should check out uh, Room Escape Artist and they have just had their escape room convention here in this, a couple months ago in, in September. It was one of the best conferences I've been to. They actually run a show. They, they have one of the beyond the screen show, uh, beyond screen shows um, or they have had up until now. And um, I, I think that connecting with them and letting them know about this because they can write a review 
I loved hearing, you know, hearing you talk about making it more robust. I used to work on a lot of uh, museum exhibits and, you know, you have to make things kid proof. It's hard, uh, but you really have to make it so that a two-year-old can just bash at it with their fist for a half an hour and it will last through that. Um, so that's really smart to think about making it more robust. Are you guys thinking about spinning off a studio? I mean, I feel like the Backyard Imagineers almost wants it wants to be a, a its own entity. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. It, it could, it could be, it could be, but um, who knows? Maybe. We'll think about it. Simon's I very just, <laughs> I mean, this is a great, and then the other third thing I was going to mention is you should submit to uh, IAPA, which is the theme park convention. Hap it's actually happening like next week in Orlando, but um, you should at least give a talk or go present if you had some funding, you could even go, I mean, it'd be really hard to take it to Orlando. I suppose if it was in LA or Anaheim or something, which it does cycle through. But I feel like this really has legs from a commercial standpoint. Um, you know, getting it from point A to point B obviously takes a lot of effort, but I, I, this is one of the things about Indicate that I love, which is first of all, if you take this to GDC, it's going to have a lot of people see it, but they're going to be a niche audience, right? It's going to be mainstream games, game companies. Um, the great thing about Indicate is like, this is all online. People can see it. We're streaming to the general public at this point. This will go into a YouTube archive. Lots and lots of people will be able to see it. And, um, but, but I always, sometimes I'll see a gem like this and I'll go, damn it. I wish this could be reach more people and so I'm, I'm hoping that you guys can find a way to do that without killing yourselves or you know having to live off of uh ramen for the next four years or whatever but it's really <laughs> it's really fantastic and i'm so excited that we were able to do this because this was the first thing i said when they asked me to do a show for this i'm like well, i want to do a live show in the actual truck and oh i don't know if we can do it it's going to be really hard and then i went as soon as Parker told me, oh, yeah, we're going to do a live show in the truck. I'm like, yes, it's fantastic. And when I come to LA, I'm going to hit you guys up to, sh to give me a walkthrough. Absolutely. Do, you ha do we have, we're going to close pretty soon. Do you have any parting comments or, or thoughts that we didn't cover? Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can uh, add on to uh, what Simon was saying earlier, too. Um, oh, yeah. So for, for all of us, like, um, when we were doing this project, uh, we were all students and a lot of us uh, have graduated already, like Justin might have mentioned earlier, we're all sort of embarking on different life paths. So collectively, it's been really hard to keep like pulling this together. Uh, and to begin with, we didn't have any intent on actually actually like capitalizing on it in any sort right. of way. Uh, this was definitely like a pure uh, us experimenting, like being really passionate and uh, just really trying to problem solve like everything we can um so it, to to that end like we got a lot out of it um we definitely like want to like keep like submitting it and like keep giving it like um viewership or giving it like exposure like what you said like really appreciate what you're saying about that um but for me personally too like i'd be really cool if it ends up like as like some urban legend like you know like a few <laughs> years down the line like it's just like randomly in the hills like in the back of pasadena it's like oh like what is this like weird truck back here yeah like, yeah yeah uh, something like that would be super cool like uh we joked about making like some sort of like sequels like uh you know like 10 years down the line uh, but that's that is like super open yeah but. it's funny because a couple of years ago uh, before right before the pandemic there was going to be a no uh, uh no proscenium was going to have their annual conference in Pasadena right by I mean like walking distance basically from you guys and I I organized a um an alt control party that was going to be like an after party for the for the it was an indicate uh no proscenium collaboration and actually Shing uh Shing who was also in the festival uh was was part of it and a bunch of other i don't know if you ever saw Claxo radio hour the interactive vintage radio that was an indicator a few years ago and i curated like a half a dozen different pieces from that um keeping my fingers crossed maybe next because they, they just i think they just had it i think maybe next year we could get you to park your truck in front of a restaurant and be part of a uh no proscenium uh, all control Absolutely. showcase okay 
we're gonna, we're gonna make yeah. that happen. All right. Yeah, well, thank Simon you. Wilson had great thoughts about, you know, the future of this. We're open to whether at Sayapa, GDC, you know, no Persinium or whoever well, has a home for this. I think that the group is open. Yeah, we should have a follow up call. I know a guy who knows a guy, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> we'll figure we'll figure it out. All right. You guys are so fantastic. I love your energy. This this it really is a remarkable accomplishment. Congratulations for getting it into Indiecade. Um, I love the kind of, uh, again, the backyard imagineering, the hacker spirit, but w combined with the like high level of skills. I mean, Art Center is has a reputation for, you know, proving people, pro uh, producing people who really know their craft and it really shows in this amazing project. So thank you guys all for coming. Uh, I'm going to start rattling through my announcements. I have like a whole pile of announcements here that I'm supposed to make, which of course I can't find my note here. Um, okay. Indicate is going on. Indicate anywhere and everywhere is going on right now, this week through Friday. And here are some things you can check out that are coming up. Uh, tonight at 7 p.m. Pacific, Sean Bouchard is going to be streaming a bunch of um, Indicate finalists uh, here on the Indicate Twitch channel. Uh, we have uh, all of the digital games are available through a Steam sale. So if you just do, you could do a rule of search for Steam Indicate or go to the Indicate website and it'll take you to that page. Not only are all the finalists in there, but also a bunch of alumni games and games that have been in prior Indicate. So it's kind of a treasure trove of indie gems that if you're into indie games at all, you should just go there and like spend all your money because it's amazing. Uh, I have a whole list of games that I'm going to actually purchase from there. Um, we also have uh, postmortems and Zoom sessions and, and developer talks going on through Friday. Oh, the Steam sale ends at 10 a.m. on Friday, but we will be having sessions through um, end of day Friday. And uh, the other thing I wanted to announce is uh, we have another event coming up uh, in about a month. The first weekend of December, the 3rd and 4th, it's going to be the Playable Theater. And you guys should come to this, actually. The Playable Theater Indicade Online Symposium, which is focused on performative, interactive theater work. So I think that ha definitely has an intersection with this, with this experience and uh, is something that I think a lot of uh, people that are in the sort of like off screen or extra screen space will want to check out. So uh, I think that's it for, for today. I'm Celia Pierce. I'm here with the Kitchen Cauldron team, an Indicade nominee from 2022. And you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. And it's a delight to talk to you and see this masterpiece work in action. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.